Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. And today I have four friends with me who don't know each other. And that's always the most fun because I, I put people together and just, you know, shake them up and see what happens, you know. Sometimes it, well, it has never exploded. I mean, I'm waiting to see if I get an explosion someday, but it never happens. We always wind up talking about things that everybody's interested in. So we've started off uh, ask, congratulating Kekushan Basu for having graduated from the University of Toronto and having entered the Cornell University Master uh, MBA program, Business Thank Administration. You. And Thank you so much. <laughs> Kekushan is a great leader since she's been five years old, believe it or not. She's been organizing people, kids, to, um, to do good things. And um, she has an organization called Green Hope Foundation. I gather you're going to keep it going even while you're in, in a, a graduate school. Is that right, Kekushan? Absolutely. My team is on the ground as I speak, and we are never stopping our work. So it's it's always going to be there on the ground. Uh huh. All right. That's great. And uh, Richard Denton is in Sudbury, uh, Ontario, I presume, as that's where you hang out. That's usually where you live. Richard is a retired physician and professor of medicine at was that Northern Ontario College of Medicine? Is that what it's called? Uh, School of Medicine uh, University now. It's its own university. Is that right? Okay. Oh, yeah. The whole university up there got into real problems. I, I don't want to hear about it now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good story. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But at any rate, Richard is also a big time Rotarian and has been the uh, president uh, or the co chair of for North America. Uh, mm -hmm. of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. So if you want to start a war, you better be careful around Richard because he's he's against it. Uh, Joan Kerr is um, a, um, I met Joan in, in connection with a victory garden. Joan was organizing people to grow their own vegetables and teaching them how and that sort of thing in their backyards and on public land and uh, we I don't know where that ever went but I I didn't I didn't stay with it long enough but then I found out that she's got other interesting activities including being very engaged with the inter, the IEEE the International Electrical in Institute Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers yeah that's a, mm -hmm. Apparently, it's a lot. It's a big, big outfit. It's, it's more than oh. just electrical engineers now. Yeah. So good, good for them, and good for you. And uh, Richard, and uh, here I am. Uh, James Simeon is in, um, in. Uh, I don't know. Are you at home? Or are you uh, at work at the at York University, James? You're I'm at home, uh, but I'm with. Uh, uh, York University's School of Public Policy and Administration, and formerly the head of McLaughlin College. Yeah, and that's the uh, York University's McLaughlin College on the green screen in the background. So it's a very nice uh, place. I don't think I've been in that building, as far as I know, but you'll have to invite me someday to look around your eyes. Uh, you're welcome up. anytime, you know that. Fine. And I impose on James all the time. Lately, I've been using him up. He's, he's been on my show several times lately, and I'll have to slow down. Anyway, it, these are folks that are that I know, but I uh, they don't know each other. And the, the neat thing about a, a schmooze day is I put people together and see what they want to talk about. So I ask each person in one sentence or so, to tell me what's on your mind, and let's see if we have any convergence of, of interest nowadays. Kekushan, what would you like to talk about today if you get your truthers? Yeah, yeah, well, the first and the thing that's on my mind right now is the NPT review conference, which is going on at this moment. I was there for the first week. I read out the interfaith statement on behalf of 104 organizations, and listening to all of the statements of all of the countries in just that first week, just thinking about like where our world is going right now, just the hope that is 
still there, of course, for creating a more safe and sustainable world, but just just so horrifying to hear testimonies from those who survived the nuclear bombs and nuclear testing and still countries refusing to move towards disarmament. Okay, that's certainly a worthy topic, no doubt about it. And I've I've received some message today that was a little bit encouraging. So maybe we'll come back to that. Richard, what's on your mind these days? Uh, the, the same sort of thing, but uh, yesterday a new report came out uh, in Nature Food that uh, points out how a limited uh, nuclear war would decimate, uh, well, actually one third or two thirds of people would be uh, wiped out uh, from even a limited war because of the soot uh, that would be put up into the atmosphere and cause a widespread famine. And also there'll be the destruction of the ozone layer, uh, which was uh, something that hadn't been previously uh, calculated about. And a lot, uh, so a lot more people will be dying from even a uh, limited war uh, in the world. And that could be India, Pakistan. It could be what's ha happening in Ukraine right now. So uh, limited war is not limited. It's worldwide. Yes, well, you certainly have cheered me up already. My God. <laughs> I know this is, you know, we have to talk about that. I don't know. It's just too horrible to contemplate, but you got to contemplate it. Joan, what's up? Well, you know me, I always have lots of things um, on the go. But one of the things that I've been working on um, is um really bringing people's attention to um pollinators because of course i i push food and growing food a lot and um many organizations are talking about um pollination gardens uh, but they're not talking about pollination habitats because we have to take care of the bees not just that the bees take care of us um so i'm working on a really amazing project that ties agriculture and um uh, uh pollination habitats together to teach people how to uh, create those um, systems. So looking food, not just as the nutrition as the Victory Garden does, but also the broader uh, spectrum of having, um, attracting the beneficial insects and, and teaching them why that's a good thing. Because it, it amazes me how little people know about food. But also to touch on this whole dis disarmament um, issue and nuclear and war and all of that, is that there's just not, in my mind, there's just not enough um, information to embrace peace. So, uh, you know, the war uh, um, uh, soldiers get out there and they're marching bands and there's lots of honors, but there's not enough of a recognition of um, peacekeepers. I mean, we have a peacekeeper program and we do, we, that's one of our programs, but it, there's just not the same recognition in the community. Um, so that, um, you know, when you see men in their uniforms and, the, you know, personally, I think of soldiers as, as you know, well, I'm not going to say because it's true. It, people will react. <laughs> OK, I get it. <laughs> it also has been used as, as a, a weapon against uh, um, in, in war torn countries. So um, just a, the whole idea that we push more about peace let people embrace peace more than talking about the, you know, the wars and things like that. So that's on my mind. Okay. Uh, good for you. And uh, James, what's up? Matt, um, I've been doing some work on the uh, triple nexus, the United Nations policy with respect to humanitarian development and peace ne ne nexus. And the emphasis is on the nexus between those three particular elements. And um, say them the again. Started, These three are humanitarian, development, and peace. And the emphasis is on um, how uh, the humanitarian agencies that are working uh, in uh, conflict sensitive and in conflict areas can actually get away from the silo effect where you have 
humanitarian agencies, you have development agencies, and you have peace groups working and getting them to collaborate and work together towards uh, developing through the um, local initiatives and national initiatives primarily. So the international actors, whether they're peace, humanitarian or development would be working through these local and national organizations in order to work towards developing more self-reliant, more resilient, more peaceful societies. So I've been looking at uh, that broad policy initiative, if you will, internationally, and seeing whether or not that is really making any progress, or um, whether as a normative model, it, it's as sound uh, as it purports to be. Now, this has come out of a number of other initiatives that took place through the United Nations over a number of years, and I'm sure you've probably heard about this before. But one of the huge challenges around this, particularly working within conflict areas, and there are some 32 wars that are taking place in the world today, most of them, of course, focused on the Ukraine right now. But um, with those 32 wars and uh, essentially about 80% of the humanitarian assistance going to conflict areas. And on average over nine years in terms of humanitarian assistance to those areas, we really don't seem to have made very much progress in terms of advancing the cause of peace. Because what's happening in the world, as you know, is the number of people that are being forcibly displaced primarily because of armed conflict or war has now gone past 100 million people or one in 78 people in the world. And uh, the amount of humanitarian development assistance is actually well below what is required. So mm -hmm. one of the huge challenges in terms of the world community is being able to actually utilize whatever humanitarian assistance is available to meet the needs of people in the world. But one of the problems here, of course, is resolving the armed conflict, which is creating the crises that we're faced with today. So I've been looking at these broad problems, if you will. Mm. Well, you certainly have the whole kitchen sink there. You know, the every everything goes into that for sure. Uh, look, I want to invite each of you to comment on whatever you, uh, you know, it it it, it uh, resonated in your own thinking. Just you don't have to put your hand up, but just uh, uh, join uh, whatever somebody else has said. What do you what do you think about uh, what each other have in in mind? Anybody so James, want to uh, comment? yeah, yeah. So James, um, this report that you've read, uh, the the Nexus. Um, is it available uh, on uh, online? And, and what is it that they're purporting as, as solutions? Uh, there are quite a, there's quite a vast literature on the area in terms of the uh, HDP nexus. And uh, there are some really great videos that have been produced. Uh, the government of Canada has adopted the nexus itself and is applying that in terms of its development okay. systems around the world and humanitarian assistance. A number of other states are doing it as well. There's the grand bargain, and I think there are 64 states in the world that are part of this, along with a number of very prominent humanitarian agencies that have uh, adopted this plan as well. So you can find information about the grand bargain. Um, yes, there's a lot of information about this. Uh, I certainly invite people to take a look at it. The real challenge, I think, particularly when you look at war itself, war obviously is a political, uh, fundamentally, essentially political thing. But humanitarian agencies, of course, pride themselves on their neutrality and being able to assist anyone in need, regardless of what the combatants are. And okay. I guess the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, is a great example. They work behind the scenes. Um, they don't get involved in terms of the issues with respect to the conflict itself and assist people on both sides of the conflict. Um, 
so the independence, the neutrality, these are very much part of the um, philosophy, the principles of humanitarian agencies, but that clashes with the fundamental nature of war itself or protracted armed conflict, which is not neutral, of course, and it creates all sorts of problems if you're looking at how can you really bring together this triple nexus because in conflict areas, uh, any sort of resources, and that could be food that's provided to one group creates, if you will, problems with the other group because you're getting involved with it politically. Um, and to get into sensitive areas where there are real serious humanitarian needs, of course, um, you have to cooperate somehow to get access to those particular areas. Mm -hmm. So that gets you politically involved, or at least you are perceived to be politically involved. So some would say the triple nexus really is contradictory <laughs> in terms of being able to achieve what it wants to achieve. So um, there, are, there are concerns with respect to this, but I understand given the pressures that the United Nations and all humanitarian agencies face in terms of providing assistance to those in need, particularly in conflict areas, um, something has to be done. And this is a new approach where they, the North Star, if you will, is in fact, how do you achieve more self-reliant, resistant, and peaceful societies by working together, collaborating, and really letting the local organizations uh, and the national organizations lead the development rather than everyone with their own separate mandate going in and trying to create separate projects to try to deal with this. But I see a fundamental problem with all of this um, <laughs> initially anyway, but uh, I, I can talk about that later. I'm taking up too well, much. Well, when you talk about having local people take charge, I mean, that is always a mantra. People to claim that that's very important in what they're doing. But on the other hand, you know, so just you watch what the complaints that we have about the kind of assistance that was given to Afghanistan and the fact that they keep pouring money in, they kept pouring money into Afghanistan, even though they knew it was being siphoned off as fast as they could pour it in by corruption. So, it, you know, in a way, there's a contradiction there too, James, that if you give money to people without, uh, you know, without monitoring them and without sort of being in charge of what they do with it, um, you can't be sure that they aren't going to um, steal it. Well, that's an excellent point. Um, and, and do the local groups. Uh, now, there there have been discussion groups that have been created in different areas where you take a, a number of opposing, if you will, people from opposing sides, get them together and have them discuss how do you best distribute the resources to meet the needs in the areas. And um, that's one model that's been applied, but what how successful that is um, I've read reports in different parts of the world, um, particularly in the Sahel, uh, countries like Burkina Faso and Mali, where it's extremely difficult to be able to provide any sort of assistance to individuals without getting embroiled within um, the various belligerent parties that are involved in those conflicts. We've got two hands up. I don't usually uh, ask people to put their hands up. Uh, but Joan, why don't you speak first, and then Ad sure, and then <clears throat> Pekushan and Adam has just arrived, probably with a question from one of our viewers. Nope. I'm not technical sure. issue. It's a technical issue. Could you please make Zoom full screen meta? The recording is being messed up with the other windows you have open in the background. Oh, I, it's because I have screen share on. That's my problem. Is that better? <laughs> yes. So that's. Uh, I Appreciate that. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Hi, Adam. Hi. What do you look? What do you? I don't know what you look like. 
<laughs> um, I'm a disembodied voice today, but just bear with me one moment. Yes, it's okay. gone back to normal. So I'll log off and let you get back. Okay, that was my bad fault. I put it on to show them something before we started, and then I forgot to turn it off. But Going back to this whole idea of uh, local um, participation, it, it always sounds like a good idea, and I myself had uh, adhered to it. But what we found was that, um, yes, the history was that um, people from the West would go in and pour a bunch of money and they leave and, you know, the project leaves with them. There is, was no continuation. So people say, oh, well, OK, we need local development and have local stakeholders and stuff. And it sound, it's a good philosophy. They should be involved. But I've been involved with um, many organizations that I work with right now <clears throat> and specifically Smart Village. And what we found was that it it there's a lot of capacity development that's needed um, uh, in terms of execution and monitoring, especially of funds, not necessarily of skills, but uh, that as well. Um, but uh, monitoring on, uh, of the progress of the spending and 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 when when for for our model, <clears throat> it's not a, a, a charitable. You actually have to generate income, but because it's coming from us at the the West, they think it's a charitable funding thing, and they can do their projects. And we we were spending so much time saying, actually, no, this is like seed money for you to start something that benefits the community. So the community has to be involved, yes, but this is for you to generate mm -hmm. and 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 write that in your concept note. So what we found is that the this whole idea of skills development and capacity development um, is something that we, and mentoring that we really had to address in the last six months um, so just to, for the record uh, those projects get 25 to two hundred thousand dollars so you know uh, before you could only apply for the 200 and we found that problem so what we did was divided it so you can initially have the 25,000 to if you have to do some consultation and some expenses and really come up with the, identifying the needs and form and then get the 200,000 to then do the project. So we're trying it. I mean, we're trying everything possible. So to get the local uh, people involved. So it's, a, it, it's growing pains. Okay, Kakashan. Yes, so for us at Green Hope Foundation, we work in 26 countries, our reach is 300,000 people. And for that, to make sure that we are actually able to address the very unique local challenges, we need the local solutions. And that is why our work is very, very localized. And that's why we work literally across the sustainability spectrum. But what we see and understand is just like the point that was made uh, previously is that we don't do charity because we have seen that when you just throw money at a problem, it's not going to work. That self-empowerment has to be there. And I think the uh, term self-reliant was mentioned, and that is like really, really important. So for us, when we work within those communities, our members are those who are from those very communities, knowing the issues inside and out, having experienced that themselves. But we kind of see ourselves as catalysts for that change. As we know that, you know, we can't just tell some that we believe in you, you can do it. We need to be able to provide some of the resources as well, just to help jumpstart that uh, getting to that self-reliance, uh, helping with however we can, whether that's through education or building uh, sustainable infrastructure, solar powered uh, libraries, all of these different uh, things to come together to ensure that there is self-reliance and self-empowerment within that community. And then, of course, our members continue to work there to ensure that it it's it's sustained. It's not something that's just a one-off. And I think that is where we need to strike the delicate balance where, of course, we understand localization is important because a one-size-fits-all solution does not work and going from the outside in without any kind of knowledge is not going to work at all. So you need to be able to strike the delicate balance so that we do act as that catalyst for change. And depending on the situation, we are able to provide support as needed. Sometimes that might be monetary, and, and most of the time, actually, it's about providing the skills and resources and infrastructure uh, so that 
uh, we know that the money is put to good use. And for us as well, like we make sure we are on the ground ourselves so that the middle people who are there, it doesn't get lost uh, in there, which is something we've seen uh, happen before. So just making sure that we strike that balance. I think that's very, very important. And once we are able to do that in different parts of the world, both in global north and global south, I think uh, there is, we, we, I'm sure we're going to see a lot more progress. Well, tell me some of the kinds of projects that you have funded, or you don't fund them, you you animate them or something. What <laughs> yes. Kind of things? Are they all, uh, they're about, mostly about global warming ish- issues and, and war, right? Conflict. It's everything, really. So we have projects uh, on uh, women's health. So we uh, work on training them to use, we distribute solar cookers, we train them on using solar cookers. So this very particular, the particular project, it's in Western India. And they, the, the problem there was that they used the unhealthy cook stoves, like the polluting ones, and they got like respiratory illnesses, and it polluted their village. And it was just bad for the people and for the planet. So by training them to use these solar cookers, they're migrant women, so when they uh, they're able to put the food in the solar cooker, it's healthy, and you know they're not getting those respiratory illnesses. Then they go out, and their children are able to then eat lunch on time because then they don't have to wait until like six o'clock to eat. Uh, and then uh, they're they're able to use the solar cookers as well, and it benefits the society, because health, and also the community because we're reducing pollution levels. We have a solar powered mobile library that's in Liberia, Bangladesh, and India right now. And it's providing books uh, to the doorstep of the children who are out of school, have forced been forced to drop out of school due to climate change, due to COVID-19, due to uh, like a lot of them are in migrant communities as well. So there's literally no chance for them to go to school. Uh, and yeah, we have lots of different, those are just two examples. And then we have our education programs all across. So like in Canada, for example, uh, I think I mentioned uh, this on like the last uh, news call as well that we work very actively with the Canadian education system. We are partners of Toronto District School Board, providing environmental education to the children and just making sure that they're stewards of the planet, like from a young age, not when they go to high school and have to do their 40 hours of volunteer service. So yeah, it's there's lots of things going on right now. And we're working on a lot of different projects as well to make sure that you know they're not just projects, but something that's long term and benefits the society as a whole. And it's mostly young, young uh, people who are part of this. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is led mostly by young people, uh, and most of whom are actually younger than uh, me as well. And yeah, but our impact, like the our target audience, it's everyone. So we are firm believers in intergenerational solidarity. So really everyone. And so it's like young people, women, vulnerable communities, uh, just really everyone. But I yeah, our team is there. Young people own it. That is hers. <laughs> you're you're yeah. the leaders and not just the uh, the young people that we're taking care of and, and teaching, you know. I mean, I love the yeah. idea that you're in charge. <laughs> uh, yeah, we try to change the narrative around how people look at young people. Like we're often seen as you know, just blaming others or like uh, striking, protesting only from the outside and not actually doing anything ourselves. But I think that that's what we want to change that, you know, we are creating change on the ground. We are uh, working very, very hard to ensure that we can create a better world and we're not just playing the blame game, but actually going out there and taking actions uh, on our own. So, yeah, I think that's we're trying to change that narrative through our work. Mm -hmm. Great. Met, you know, Meta, sorry, I have to uh, run, um, but just uh, closing some closing uh, great work, Kekishan, and I have my own foundation with the uh, the Climate Smart Victory Garden. And all of the things uh, uh, that ha- has been said, the self-reliance, the peace, uh, development, humanitarian work is what we do. And so um, I-, I work with different organizations to execute them because we felt that our biggest thing was to collaborate with uh, organizations in order to, instead of inventing everything ourselves. One of the things that I wanted to explore when when James first mentioned it was this other contradiction that you mentioned, James, the notion that um, if you're dealing with conflicts, then humanitarian action is part of the 
of the problem or part of the, the politics of the thing so that one side doesn't want you to go around feeding their enemies or even healing their enemies. I, I wonder if, if um, Richard has ever come into a situation in which your uh, ethic of uh, giving uh, medical care to everybody equally without regard to whether you like them or not has uh, become problematic in in a particular context in which you you're in in a situation of conflict where people don't want you doing good things to their enemies. Personally, no. Um, although, uh, as, as a doctor, uh, you're often faced uh, with triage of ha having to just select. Uh, who you're going to uh, treat, who is going to uh, be amenable uh, to your treatment and who is not. Um, so that certainly uh, does occur on a fairly regular basis. Um, luckily, I've not been involved in conflict situations, but certainly, again, what we have seen is Médecins uh, Sans Frontières, um, has had their hospitals attacked. Um, we have seen uh, uh, soldiers uh, hiding in hospitals, hiding in schools, hiding in plazas, uh, et cetera, and therefore um, those places have been bombed. Uh, I, we've seen, uh, so certainly the opposition will, uh, the enemy will, uh, attack uh, people who are trying to do good on both sides. Uh, so uh, that, that, that definitely happens. Uh, just also, they'll go back. Um, th this conversation has been very rich. Uh, and I'll, I'll just go back to uh, what sort of Jones' interest was, was on insects. And uh, this latest report uh, on food uh, security or well, uh, on uh, the, res the effects of a nuclear war, a limited war, uh, but it's uh, global consequences looked at the uh, destruction of the ozone layer. And certainly that would uh, affect uh, insects. Really? A and that has not been looked at so again, we still need to do further research. We still uh, do not know the full implications of even a limited uh, nuclear war and how that will uh, affect things. I guess uh, we've been sort of talking about the old adage, you know, think uh, globally, act locally. And to me, it, it all comes down to money. Uh, and so one of the solutions uh, is to not invest in uh, the fossil fuels uh, industry, not to invest in the military. Uh, my, my concern is that, uh, you know, we talk about national security and we spend trillions of dollars uh, towards the military. But uh, what is really important for you and I is our personal security. And the personal security is affected by the global problems of uh, the climate change, pandemics, nuclear weapons, and, and then a whole host of other things, the uh, inequalities uh, between the very rich and the poor and uh, racism and poverty and all of that sort of thing. Uh, so, Again, I think it, it comes down to as locally that we need to uh, make sure that we're not investing in fossil fuels, not investing in the military, uh, but we also need to speak out globally and get our politicians to uh, do the same. And that's where the difficulty ar arises. But I think uh, we're seeing this happen at a local level uh, just recently um, all the mayors in the United States, again, once again, endorsed, actually they've been doing this for 16 years, endorsed the Mayors for Peace resolution uh, to 
get, again, governments not to be investing in the military and to investing in humanitarian uh, aid, the education, health care, et cetera. I'll leave it at that to let mm -hmm. my colleagues carry on. Mm -hmm. Um, I can definitely speak to that. I think that there is always this false sense of security that is like governments often uh, put across saying that nuclear weapons or military, it's there for our safety, but it's really not. And it's like, it's just another way to put all of that money and into these weapons of mass destruction and take it away from sectors that actually matter, like education and healthcare, which, as you said, is our personal security as well. So, yes, I think there's definitely need for greater uh, transparency in terms of where the money goes, how taxpayers' money is being used, and really ensure that this the propaganda that is really there by uh, nuclear-armed states and their allies and those who you know, or have have these the military really and put money in there. How they can where that money goes, and just making sure their citizens know that this is what their money is going towards. And I think that you know we've worked with a lot of countries where they have moved away from uh, their military, and one such example is Costa Rica. And like everyone in their country has spoken out about how uh, it's so wonderful that not having a standing military, how it's benefited the country, and how they have high standards of living, a strong economy, peace, security, a healthy environment, just because you know they're not investing their resources in some. In, fighting, they're actually investing their resources in peace. So I think that, yeah, there needs to be a lot more done in terms of that. But so I'm hopeful that slowly and steadily through peace education, through disarmament education, which is something that we're doing right now, really making sure that everyone knows about this, this disparity that does exist. And for us, particularly, we use this disarmament education because, and especially for children and young people, because what we've seen is that all of these issues regarding arms and particularly nuclear weapons, it's there's this veil of secrecy that exists. And only when you're like much older, like when you're full adults, that do you realize that, okay, there are these weapons that exist and young people are kind of pushed away from that. And by then, your mindset is kind of already there it's difficult to change that so we want to be well, able to I make want, sure I, I that they go said, there so i want to know yeah. what you just said you think young people are uh, kept away from awareness of, on nuclear weapons they're deliberately kept away from it because i think there's denial all kinds of places and maybe more among young people than old but i hadn't been uh thinking in terms of anybody actually trying to keep young people from knowing about nuclear they, weapons they I don't think. want people young people to know when we've gone into schools this is not this is like all across the world really like some schools have been very accepting and when we've spoken about it in other schools they're like no don't tell young people about that that's not something they should know really? about uh it's a it's a taboo topic and especially in countries where are that are nuclear armed states or allies it's seen as a complete taboo so you're not allowed to talk to young people about it and you know obviously that's what we've seen especially in nuclear armed states is yeah it's a way to make sure that they don't know that how bad these weapons are and instead they're able to listen to what the government says that just that it's good and it helps uh the country and it keeps them safe so yeah that is something that we have seen it's very sad but it is it is happening and that is something we are trying to make sure that at least if our youth are aware then uh you know they when they come into positions of power or when they they're able to spread that message to their parents and their community uh the right decisions can be made. So that's, well, I'm aware that's definitely of that, there. And you know, we're always complaining about the fact that the media, the press, doesn't give enough coverage to the risks involved in nuclear weapons. But I hadn't thought about the notion that young people in particular are trying to, that, that somebody is deliberately trying to keep young people from knowing about it. Do either you, James or Richard, I have, were you aware of that? That's a very interesting idea. Very, very much so. I certainly concur uh, uh, what you've just uh, said, uh, Kirkushan. Uh, we ha have uh, 
had to go into the schools to teach uh, students uh, in high school about uh, nuclear weapons because it was not being taught. In Rotary, uh, we have actually just got uh, some global grants to do just that. Uh, Tom Sauer is doing this in uh, Belgium. Uh, we're uh, World Beyond War is doing this around the world with uh, some of their projects. But for, I fully agree with Kirkushan that this is not being taught about. And it's uh, being definitely excluded in the media, as you say, uh, Meta. And you know, when you look at uh, the contribution of the military as a segment of society, it's the greatest user of fossil fuels. It's the greatest uh, polluter of greenhouse gases. And as a result, it was excluded from Kyoto, Paris, COP26, and uh, probably COP27 coming up. So the, the powers that be just do not want this to be talked about. And I think also our youth uh, did not grow up during the Cold War. They don't know about uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Berlin Wall falling down, etc. And so they are not aware of that. And again, uh, as Kirkushan has said, it's not taught in the schools. And uh, and, and so that's why uh, we now have a project. I don't know if you've had her on, on your program, Meta, as a, a, a 22-year-old film de uh, developer who's making a movie, a 90-minute documentary called 1.5 Degrees of Peace. And she's interviewing uh, high school and young uh, adults on their uh, impressions and thoughts between the climate change and nuclear weapons. So the 1.5 degrees is the climate and uh, uh, peace is the military. And you know what we have seen, I think, is that us old gray-haired people uh, have got uh, worked through the United Nations and we've got the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons through and uh, Kirkushan is right now at uh, the MPT uh, negotiations. I was there about uh, three years ago on the uh, preliminary and uh, was not optimistic and they did not come to any consensus. And I'm not sure, again, Kirkushan, if you want to comment on your optimism or not for, uh, currently uh, as, as you're watching uh, what's going on there. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. You know, I named my organization Green Hope Foundation. So I have that hope for uh, the future. And, you know, I was there for the TPNW as well that just took place in June. Yeah. Uh, so I think that there obviously you had states that weren't the nuclear club of nations, but who had united to be, you know, to call for nuclear disarmament and knew what uh, the impacts of nuclear uh, weapons are and why we should never even think about building them or using them. So I think that there is definitely hope. I think it's important we use that hope and turn that uh, like our dream into a reality. I think there is a lot being done, but a lot more can be done as well. Uh, I what I've from my experiences on the ground, what I one thing I have understood is that you know we are not going to see the result of all of this in one day. It's something that is going to take time, and sometimes you know we it will test our patience because you know we want to see the results right away. But I do believe that there will be uh, positive results. There can be positive results. And I think that just putting our work into it and ensuring that we can spread the words that more and more people can get involved as well. I think that's really uh, the way to go. So yes, I do maintain that hope and I'll continue to make sure that, you know, I use my uh, work to spread the message and ensure others come in as well so that really together we can uh, move towards this safer and more sustainable world. Thank you, Kekasan. Awesome. Thank you for being you so here, much. too. Yeah, For sure. Thank Good. you so much. Good Take care. You. James, I'd like to ask you about that because it's it's kind of intriguing me that young people are being shielded from this. And that's a new, new notion to me, even though 
you know, it's been many years since I was working with any number of young people. I mean, I haven't really taught much in 25 years, frankly. But um, I wonder if you, do you have any impression that anything like that happens at the university level? That if, if there's any, of course, nobody interferes with university professors teaching what they want to exactly. But, you know, you do get, there, there, there's, there are degrees in which you can be encouraged or discouraged from doing certain things. What do you think? Is, that, is that anything like that happening at the university level, that students are being shielded from knowledge about nuclear matters? I'm not sure if I um, see a deliberate attempt to shield people or to deny people from that kind of information at the university level. But I can tell you from my own personal experience on a number of initiatives that peace is not a very popular subject among the students today. Um, it may be a, a sense of cynicism. It may be um, the general malaise in terms of political processes and so forth, but um, I've tried a number of events uh, and speakers uh, talking about world peace, recognizing September 1st as the World Day, UN World Day of Peace. And um, the attendance from students is really not that great. Um, but is, is it, if, you, if you put on an event like that, would the faculty be more receptive than the students? Certainly. I think the faculty and maybe staff um, and a few students, I'm not saying that all students, but uh, it's not a very popular issue amongst the student body but you know when i was an undergraduate i remember the anti-war vietnam war movement the peace movement was really strong back then uh and i think uh students were really galvanized around peace issues but uh, it's changed entirely and just to go back to um richard's point in terms of the amount of expenditures and the fact that the military is not green in any sense. Um, I, I would agree with that. Um, but, you know, we were warned about the military industrial complex. And I think most societies are geared around military industrial complexes. Mm -hmm. And it's in their interest and in societal interest to maintain that. That's where all the good paying jobs are people going into the military and they're devoted to careers in the military and, you know, they, they aspire to this or they're in industry and they're developing these weapons and so forth. How do you break through all of that? Um, I think one of the fundamental things that needs to be done is there has to be a general acceptance in terms of the human rights for peace. And if that's generally accepted, then I think anytime anyone resorts to violence at a societal level uh, will be viewed as a criminal. And that would be the most heinous crime that anyone could commit, a crime of aggression. So I don't think we've generally recognized or accepted that there's a fundamental human right for peace, which really allows for all of the other human rights to be exercised as well. Um, so how do you get that across to people that, that there is a fundamental human right to peace anytime that is violated in any way by an aggressor that they sh there should be an immediate response by the international community to go after that individual and to deal with them. And I don't think we've arrived at that yet. Mm -hmm. Just to add uh, there, uh, I would add uh, Eisenhower's military industrial complex is now the military industrial political entertainment complex. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of, it, it, it's subtle, but uh, so it, uh, Meta, it's not that uh, we can't teach about this, but what uh, happens at the university level uh, is all the funding 
uh, goes uh, to uh, military issues and not to uh, certainly peace. So if you want to make a living and get research grants, you're going to have to do it uh, in some form of uh, military uh, development of products, et cetera, uh, that, uh, that's where, where, where the money is. So it, it, it's subtle, uh, it, it's not transparent, it's uh, opaque, uh, but it is there nonetheless. You know, I think there's something else too. And I, I, I think sometimes I'm disappointed with peace people. <laughs> That's my, these are my team, but I, I, I feel sometimes there's a tendency for peace people to just simply say, ignore the conflict, pretend that there's no real issue, you know, just take whatever peace you can get. And, and if, if your side is defeated in an issue that you think is of stupendous importance, well then shut up about it because you, we should have peace and peace is the only thing that counts. And, and, and there are times when, you know, when, when people feel that the issue that they're involved with is so important that they really would be willing to die for it. And, and, you know, as a peace person, I don't usually respect that point of view, but, but there is something altruistic uh, uh, at, at root here. And I think when peace, uh, about, you know, half of the emails that I get nowadays are from people who, who just want to uh, have peace, even if it doesn't involve any decision about who gets to win what, what peace, for example, in Ukraine, you know, just, just stop fighting and never mind whether your city is controlled by the people you want or you, or somebody you loathe, uh, just settle for peace. And, and I don't, I don't think it's that way. I think real peacemaking has to be recognized that war is part of a politics as Clausewitz would have it. And that, people really do sometimes have conflict issues that have to be taken seriously. So the one thing I like about the Gandhian people and Gandhi himself was that he took seriously the idea that it matters whether you win or lose. He really wanted India to become independent, for example, and it was really important. So he was trying to show how you can win and still do it with peace. And so the development of techniques of continuing your struggle or attempting to get what you really feel is important, even though you don't have the, the weapons you might need to, to win the war or the number of people, and you may be outnumbered, but the I think it's really an important part of peace building to take account of the fact that conflicts are real and very important to people. So when you're in the middle of a war, as we are right now, um, you know, peace people can come up with a thousand things that might have discouraged the onset of war, might have helped prevent war. But once you've got a war going, you, you try to stop it. And I'm sorry, but people are are so committed to their issue. And I don't think that's all contemptible. Sometimes it's it's really, you know, it's it's so important to you that you really would be glad to sacrifice your own, everything you have for this for the cause. And um and unless you peace activists think of methods of 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 doing struggle nonviolently, then um I I don't I I I, I think we're wasting our time, frankly. Uh, well, I, I fully agree with you, Meta. I think I mean yesterday was uh, India's Independence Day, and Pakistan uh, celebrated it the day before. So what you're saying is very relevant. I think that 
uh, conflict is always going to be with us, but I think that using war to settle those conflict is not, uh, not uh, the norm or uh, our future and that we can get around it. Now, I think also that you're right. Uh, we need to look at the root causes as opposed to just stopping uh, fighting. I think we, we definitely need to stop fighting, but uh, I think we need to look at the root causes. I think that it has been shown that women uh, negotiators do look at the root causes. And so decisions that, or peace settlements that have been uh, done that have involved women tend to last much longer than those uh, that are done by men, which are more of the quick fixes. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we can look at what happened after World War I, what happened after World War II, and how the men carved up uh, Europe in, in terms of uh, maps, uh, but didn't understand uh, the tribal uh, conflicts uh, throughout those countries where they drew up the maps and thus got into uh, what we're still uh, having is uh, uh, conflicts. So um, conflicts are, are a part of life, but war uh, does not need to be the answer. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think the Gandhian approach that you talked about, nonviolence resistance in terms of uh, resolving, trying to resolve the conflicts, certainly... Um, is the way to go. Violence begets more violence. Uh, there's no way to resolve the conflict that way, I think. Um, but you also have to realize that in the context of where we are today, it is the most radical solution. People consider peace and nonviolence as a radical approach to dealing with conflict situations. The norm is violence. And that's why Gandhi gets assassinated, why Martin Luther King gets assassinated. The leaders of the peace movement, nonviolence resistance, are always seen as the most radical. Mm -hmm. And uh, the individuals that will disrupt the status quo, uh, there are so many people that benefit from violence, the benefit from protracted armed conflict, the stakeholders, the beneficiaries, uh, they're not interested in any way in terms of promoting peace. So I think that is a fundamental problem. And changing that mindset, I think, is really critically important. Mm -hmm. By the way, Richard, this thing about women, you know, I'm, I'm uh, almost amused that uh, Doug Roach published an article in the in the Hill Times naming names of women who are not uh, everything you uh, attribute to our sex. <laughs> women in the Canadian government are not necessarily any any uh, more peaceful loving than uh, than their male counterparts. So, uh, perhaps Margaret Thatcher might fit that list. I can think of a whole bunch of others. Matter of fact, I've got a mean streak of my own, which I don't like. <laughs> <to show recently. laughs> well, thank you. I, thank you very much for participating in this wide ranging. We certainly covered a lot of territory today and it's been, been fun as usual to get together well, Meta, with my thank friends. Thank you so much for organizing this and arranging it. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Meta. All right. Take care, guys. Thank Swim you, answer. Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Project Save the World produces one of these shows three days a week, sometimes more. This is episode 490. You can watch or listen to them as audio podcasts on the website to save the world.ca. And we even post transcripts there eventually. When you get there, look around. We have conversations there about six global issues, plus potential reforms in governance, economics, and civil society. To find a particular sh talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar, or the name of one of the guest speakers. And after you've watched or listened, share your own thoughts about the show. This is a place for dialogue. 
Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can buy a single copy or subscribe for $20 Canadian per year through PressReader. Just go to PressReader.com on your browser and in the search bar, enter the word Peace. You'll see the cover of the current issue and buttons to click to subscribe.